Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of SkyMall, Baby Einstein, P90X, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Steve Wexler, who's not one of America's leading direct response copywriters, but the leading America's direct response copywriter. And is leading director. Yeah, and I'm gonna I'm gonna have you explain that in a second because I had to correct that. He's helped his clients generate millions of dollars with his control beating packages. What's especially interesting is that with his decades of experience, as I go through your site, Steve, you've created successful direct mail packages, print ads, website copy, radio, and much more. But I have to go back to the leading direct response copywriter. Yeah, um, yeah well, I, I used to be a screenwriter for Charlie Chaplin. That's how old I am. But uh, um, yeah, my my slogan is America's leading direct mail copywriter. And when I did an interview with uh, Bob Ly, he said that was quite pompous. Bob, if you're listening, you remember the story. Um, he said, "How do you how do you how do you qualify that?" And the, the answer is simple. My job is to my job is to write copy and get around objections like Bob had. And every trade show, inevitably I run into my uh, contemporaries and always walking to the bathroom back and forth with copywriters. And I always make sure when I'm walking with other copywriters to the bathroom at the trade shows, I'm the one who's leading. I'm ahead. I go in first. I get out of it. And that's how I came up with it. So it's justified, Bly, okay? So does that have any, anything to do with the prostate uh, packages you write? About the bathroom? No, no, no. I, I, I'm, I'm well versed on prostate. I never pee. I haven't peed in ten years. Okay. So that's, that's, pigeons come and take it away from me. Um, yeah, because I saw that in your side. I did see America's leading direct response copywriter, and I purposely put in who's one of because who am I to say who's the leading direct response? So I'm glad you made that correction for me. I never said I was the best. I just said I was leading. Got it. Um, so I always like to include a fun fact, Steve, and you're going to dig into all your life lessons and great stories. Um, fun fact that I would have never expected is you're a heavy metal drummer. My whole life. My whole life. Uh, Where does that come from? I, I, you know, I was supposed to be a rock star, but nobody else believed me and it never happened. But uh, I, I played with uh, uh, Richie Sambora for five years from Bon Jovi. Um, I've uh, played with Meatloaf, with Edgar Winter, with a uh, whole bunch of guys for 15 minutes. 15 minutes, uh, that counts. 15 minutes is something, my 15 minutes of fame. And uh, I guess we started, um, you know, I, I was sure I was going to be a rock star and then have to go to school. And, um, I was making a hell of a lot of money back when I was a kid. I think we made like $1,000 a week to go to rehearsal, which was insane in the you know, and we signed to Swan Song Le Records, which was Led Zeppelin's label. Oh. And the drummer from Led Zeppelin, my, my idol, my, John Bottom, died. And everybody who was signed to Swan Song was thrown off. Hmm. And there I was with no money, living with mom and dad, and decided to go to school. So, yeah, I was, I was, uh, that was my, my plan. Like, so I still play drums three, four times a week on stage, and jam them out. So how does you, your training as a drummer and being a drummer, you think, help you as a copywriter? As with anything creative, thinking out of the box and, you know, getting people to pay attention when you're in the back and it's all those guys with better asses than you in the front. Um, and, and, you know, and uh, it's creativity, you know, it's just another outlet to be creative. Yeah. And I want to hear about some of the, the early days. Uh, also, Steve, the but, what's that? The spandex. I don't look good in spandex. Spandex. So. Well, I'll po I'll post a picture in the in the post for sure. Okay. Um, what's one thing the audience could do right now to start improving their copy or or sales messages? If I had to give you one key, I guess the tip would be to speak to your audience as, as I'm speaking to you. Speak to somebody. Be conversational. If you're going to speak about an anti-aging product, hey, Jeremy, if you were going to sell me an anti-aging product and you said, Steve, I'd like to improve your vigor and virility, you'd probably smack me. Who speaks like that? Nobody speaks like that. Who uses the word vigor or virility? Right. You'd probably say, Steve, look, 
you look like you need a little bit of energy. You're looking a little bit old. Maybe you don't know, speak to. I don't think I'd say that to either because I think you – are you from New York or where are you from? I'm from Brooklyn. Brooklyn, yeah. So I would not say that to someone from Brooklyn. I may uh, get slapped back. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's just about having a conversation. Whether you're having a conversation with one person or a million people, you're not going to use words. And, you know, I, I see a lot of these young copywriters and they get out there and they just start – speaking languages that they never would, you know, they wouldn't say to bar to their friend. Mm -hmm. you know, we're not writing textbooks. We're not writing brochures. We're writing conversation pieces. Mm -hmm. Only we're the only one talking, which is my favorite kind of conversation. Yeah. It's a good point. Did you learn that from someone or naturally or did you learn it the hard way? I learned that from millions of people who wouldn't buy pretentious copy. Millions of people told me, said, that piece is going to fail. Can you please say it again? Now tell me ways that I understand. Which one was it? Do you remember one? I mean, this is just years and years of you know the the, the best way of the best way to success is failure. Yeah. So if, if if you count the, if you keep failing, then you got to start analyzing what's wrong. Eventually, you'll you'll get it. But conversational copy is probably the, the key point in ways is is a is a key to any copyright success. Yeah. How did you know it was that and not like someone would say, well, maybe that headline's horrible and no one read the rest of it? I don't think there was any, you know, pinnacle moment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of like when a baby's walking and his left foot is facing that way. Oh, that's not going to work. Let's try. Oh, yeah, what kind of thing? I it this way. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, testing, which is, you know, which is, you know, imperative to any successful writer. Yeah. So I want to go back to growing up what's a good story where do you get your influence from from growing up uh, influence in writing no anything just in life something that influenced you early on i think being a musician made me uh, uh help me get my success in, in writing just because it's creative also i wish i could remember the, the professor's name in college who uh, gave me a d in english and told me I should, you know, get a fruit stand. <laughs> um, but uh, she didn't like that I spoke conversation. Were your parents in writing, or my father was uh, a combination kosher butcher and uh, wannabe uh, Spanish guitarist, we were guitarist. Nice. And my mom was an artist. Did you ever help out your dad? Uh, delivering? Yeah, delivering or cutting me or what? What was it like? Yeah, I got fired because I would take drumsticks and just pound, you know, everything I saw and then eventually got thrown out of the store. So, yeah, that lasted for 15 minutes as well. So, yeah. how did you transition to copywriting? Um, again, we were, um, uh, I was thrown out off the Swan Song Records and left penniless on the street. And I said, man, now what am I going to do? You know, yeah. this rock star thing isn't going to work out. I went back to college, and when I left college, a cousin of mine called me up and said, hey, you want to be the warehouse manager of uh, Dr. Leonard's catalog, which was, uh, never heard of them, they were a very successful home health care catalog, selling wheelchairs and seniors' aids and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, started as a rebuyer. Uh, basically, a rebuyer is a monkey's job. They tell you to order a thousand units, and you call them up and say, let me have a thousand units. And looking over the catalog, I'm just a kid fresh out of college, and I realized that, wow, these little words on this paper is why people are ordering. And so I started writing, and the orders started getting bigger. Because hmm. our writers, I guess, weren't that good. And, you know, just little blurbs. Uh, I guess mini Skyball type of copy. Mm -hmm. One paragraph, two paragraphs, and you're out. And my, my phone calls started getting more influential. They have 5,000 pieces, they have 10,000. Let me have a container load. So I, I started really realizing the, the power of copy early on. What were you sending out? Were you changing little excerpts in the catalog itself, or what were you actually changing? I was rewriting headlines, which is you know, half the battle. If you don't get them to read your headline, you don't get them anywhere inside. The, nobody reads an ad without reading the headline. Right. So it, it gave me... Uh, it gave me really good training uh, in, in writing compelling headlines because you only have five lines an hour. You know, now I write long form 24, 32 page pieces and websites and you know, radio. And, but um, 
the conciseness of selling something in short form copy was really a, a really a help. Of course, when I had to transfer to the luxury of 32 pages to make a case, I was wow, this is freedom, you know? <laughs> I keep writing. But um, I think writing short form copy may be one of the hardest types of copywriting around. It's a lost art. Yeah. So what did you do after Dr. Leonard's catalog? Um, I went and started a competitor, Health House USA, for a company called... Um, Jesus, I can't even remember the name. But anyway, Health House, Health House USA, which was the brother of the owner of Dr. Leonard's, and I guess they were at war and started beating my old company. And there I, I went to work with a guy named Bill, uh, Bill, uh, Paul Romano and Jack Kruman out of Florida. They had a company called Health U. And uh, started my training in long form copy, and then I started my own business. So, do you have mentors? Were was someone there mentoring, or were you just learning on the fly? Yeah, that's it. That's I, I was lucky. Everybody needs a mentor. I was taught by two of the best, which are the two brothers, Larry Brown and Steve Brown. Steve Brown started a company called Cheese Lovers, and they were the biggest mailers on Long Island, in New York. They they just owned the post office there, and he used to write copy. Sort of like the old Swiss colony, you know, I'm, I'm very old, so this is much older than me. But they'd have, you know, huge hunks of cheese and these serpents going through the holes of Swiss cheese and these almost naked women wrapped around the serpents, and, you know, and they're traveling around the world finding these exotic cheeses. It was huge. And then they brought me in to do this health camp. And from there. So what else did Steve teach you that you remember? Steve was cool. Steve was, uh, um, yeah. I was the only non-Orthodox Jew in this place that was really? all Orthodox Jews. Hmm. And, uh, well, the only two. And Steve was the, the, the other one. So I was sort of like the liberal on the other side. The other one, you know, and he, he during um, what they call minion during the day, go and pray. Steve and I did my own minion. Just learning copywriting from this genius. Mm -hmm. It's been about an hour a day with him, and he tear apart everything I wrote. Said, that sucks. That's horrible. This is terrible. And eventually, the yelling got less and less. <laughs> so, so, was something sinking in, or were you just trial by fire? Sinking in, or I get fired. It was trial by fire. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I yeah, you had to get there. You know, he just basically pulled me in and said, "Hey." This kid who was rebuying product at the old company and writing a little bit of copies. Yeah, start a catalog. <laughs> you know, they just threw you in. Really, just threw you in. Just threw me in. Well, I think I, I think I falsified some of the resume. <laughs> well, you could write catalogs from scratch. Yeah, sure. Right in my. So, was it tough to then strike out on your own, or how was that decision? No, it was. You know, well, it wasn't tough. I, I was. Uh, the company that I worked for, they, they didn't want to use, they, didn't, they weren't successful with that. They didn't want to throw enough dollars in the catalog, and suddenly I was with two kids and a, you know, and a wife and two cars and a big ass house and a giant lawn and no way to pay for it. So, uh, remember that night, I came home and said, Well, that's the last paycheck, and I ran and spent it all on toys for my kids and borrowed 10 grand from a good friend of mine, and we started uh, the Steve Wexler Creative Group. Right there, America's leading direct mail. Love it. Where copying ideas generate millions. <laughs> so that sounds pretty scary, though. When you have no alternative, you find ways to make money. Money can be had, but you need motivation. Like mm -hmm. starvation is a good motivator. That is a big motivator. And having your kids, you know, penniless and naked on the streets is another motivator. So you figure it out. So what do you do first when you start your own company? You go and spend your last paycheck on your kids on worthless toys, and then you figure it out. Uh, you uh, I put out ads in all of the papers, um, used whatever connections I had, and, and eked out a couple of jobs, and did a couple of print ads, and a magalog, and then another one, and another one, and you know, 20 years later, uh, still doing it and pretty successful. So, Steve, when you first put out those ads, what were you advertising for? What did, what kind of jobs did you want to get early on? Well, I had, I had a, you know, my specialty in the health market and the seniors market. Yeah. 
and kind of know who their wants and desires because yeah. that's where I was thrown in. I was thrown into that arena and that's where my specialty was for, yeah. you know, 10, 15, 18 years prior to that. And I'm still in that arena, you know, selling a lot of supplements, uh, health supplements. And basically that's where the direct mail business is all the from. You know, and of course, gone off to do web and some TV and radio and morphed out as, as the internet starts to squashing the mailbox, you know, you're moving out. But it's 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 the health supplements that, that uh, have been my specialty for a very long time. Yeah. So what are some of those wants and desires that most people don't know about, but you're so familiar with the seniors that you think like them? Well, I, I, uh, I tend to pee in my pants a lot. <laughs> No, uh, <laughs> everybody wants to be younger. Everybody wants to be younger. When you, Jeremy, look in the mirror, you see yourself maybe five, seven, as much as you can. Like 10 years. Five, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, of course, I see myself as a skinny, wrinkle-free, beautiful young man. The music you listen to now, I don't know you. This is the second time we've spoken. I can pretty much guess it's the same music you listen to when you're just 18 and 20. You know, when you have your car windows closed up, and you're <laughs> something you're not, I can pretty much guess it's nothing current. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you do listen to current just so you can feel better about yourself. But what you grew up with in your prime, which you had fun with, is how you look at yourself. And when you look in the mirror, and you kind of look at yourself as that guy. I still look at myself as that 30-year-old guy, you yeah. know? Yeah. Not tricking anybody but my own mind, but... You do. Right. And I think that's the same motivator for seniors. You want to be younger because that's where the fun was. Yeah. You want to dress younger. You want to feel younger. You want to, you know, you want to, you want to run up the stairs, not feel pain. You want to sleep better. You, you know, all the things that you had when you were younger and healthier, you want now. And again. Yeah. So it's just, it's not being older. It's just being human. Mm-hmm. Everybody wants to feel like they did in their prime. Yeah. So after you struck out on your own, what was the next big milestone for you, for your your own company? We, we got pretty big, and you know, since then I've, I've hired uh, dozens of writers worldwide and artists, and the company got pretty big. And um, got to travel the world. You know, I was in clients in the south of France and Moscow, and had thirty foot booths in London. And, What's been your favorite trip throughout the years that you remember? There's been a lot of favorite trips. I still take favorite trips right now with my buddy Dave Klein. You know, mm-hmm. I, actually, my office is in Macromall. Dave's uh, this is where I am right now. Oh, nice. Um, my favorite trip might have been Moscow. What'd you do? I, I went down to sell a diet tea, to write about a diet tea, and I went down to consult. And... Um, if you haven't been to Moscow, you haven't been to Russia, everything you imagine it to be, gloomy and everyone pissed off and drunk, is absolutely true. It, it is gloomy and people drink a lot. As a matter of fact, I almost didn't get paid for the assignment because I refused to um, I refused to have horseradish laced vodka at 6 a.m. meeting, which was a little rough. But uh, that was a very memorable trip. I don't know a lot of people have, have done Moscow. So it was a tea product? What was it? It was a slimming tea product. It was, it was something. But they were very hot on it. And they, I guess they had the concept when they were drunk on horseradish. <laughs> and, and to take the free trip to Moscow to consult, I said, okay, this is good. Even the plane ride was fun. You know, I shared the plane with the chickens and roosters and other things. People it eggs. It was, was kind of cool. So you said, you know, your your company grew, you had to hire a lot of writers. What's the hardest part about having a big company and growing? When you have a, a large company, you have a lot of projects, and your name is on everything. Mm-hmm. There's nothing that goes out of here that, uh, if I'm not writing it on my own, I'm not, I'm, I'm rewriting it. And before you let it out, you know, people are in a hurry for this stuff. They have, they have names that get old and they have printers who are chomping at the bit to, you know, get your, your stuff on press and you want this thing perfect because you're 
last mailing is as good as, as, as what you remember for. So if you have a failure, and you maybe get another, you know, one or two more, and then you're done with that company. Just like an actor, you know, it's very similar to acting. You know, you Tom Cruise is in a dud. All right, he's in another dud. Yeah, he's in three more duds. He's done. Yeah. You know, and that's basically the way it it's is. Reputation. It's your reputation. So everything has your name on it, and I don't, I don't farm out copy and let it go. I rework everything. Rework everything, and then you know, I'd say a good twenty-five percent of it for certain clients. I write from beginning to end, you know, um, so just can't trust other writers involved, you know. But yeah, I'm doing anywhere between ten and twenty different projects a month. How do you manage all of them? Um, it's a lot. I lose hair. I yeah, you look sleep. like you have more hair than me, so. It's yeah, well, it's implants, I guess. No, I... I <laughs> you take that vitamin I saw on your site. It says, uh, I think it is a regrow hair. Or, do you have hair problems? Or Yeah, there's a couple of <laughs> hair products. <laughs> but no, no, I don't, have, I, don't, I don't have hair. Thankfully, that's the only thing that's still on me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about writing that package. It's like, uh, you know, that comes across your desk, right? Something yeah. uh, about... Hair loss, every, you know, that's a huge problem. How, Not in, as much anymore for guys. Really? You know, it's not like it was 20 years ago, you know. You were bald. That guy looks weird. Now it's kind of cool. There's UFC fighters. And people, you know, people are scared. You look kind of scary and cool if you're bald. But women is, is probably a much bigger problem. Right now. That was what that one was for. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, you know, and... and uh, When you write a package like that, you have to um, you have to put yourself in that mindset. Now, I'm, I'm not a woman, and right. I'm not 70, but I use some uh, concept that I think I invented, but probably Bob Bly and other guys will argue that they invented it. Uh, it's called method copywriting. And just like Robert De Niro, you know, you sit there and you become that person. Mm -hmm. sit there, before you start writing, man, I sit down and imagine what it would feel like to be you know, a woman who's now losing their hair and how devastating it is how you want to cover up before you leave the house and, you know, uh, you can go to a restaurant with friends. What would it be like with everybody looking, looking at you as you're sickly or less of a person? Or, you know, and if you put yourself in that, now, now I got past the sick part, now I have to get myself in the women's clothes too. Right. So method copywriting is exactly uh, uh, the key to writing some kind of package like that because it's... Something that I wouldn't initially relate to. I'm a guy, right? You know? So, uh, but that—that's what helps me through it. You kind of have to become a part. So, how do you do that? You know, I picture you in like Mel Gibson, like What Women Want. You're putting on like nylons or something. Like, what do you that's actually? Fun. You what know, do you actually do? That's that's just called Wednesday. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's you know you say that and I, it makes perfect sense. But I'm thinking, how would I even? do that you know what do you have a method behind the method you know i, I studied jujitsu for 12 years mm -hmm. and what i got out of jujitsu more than you know fighting which were adults who really don't get in fights but the 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 cerebral part of it the meditation part of it the, the you know they teach you when you when you throw a punch, you don't just throw a punch. You imagine energy going through your, your, your arm, and your fist becomes like a ball. And then when you hit, you know, so it's hmm. it's a visualization. It's a visualization, and you sit there and you go and you say, well, "What are the problems this person has?" You know, the first thing she has is man, you know, I've got to go out and meet my friends. People are looking at me. I feel like a less of a person. What would that feel like if I was losing hair and I'm a woman? You know. Is it embarrassing? You bet your ass it's embarrassing. Is there ways to cover up? Sure, they all look phony. So you have to talk about the objections of people seeing through to your problem, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and just put yourself in that place and breathe and then start writing really shitty copy. And then it's better and better and better as you get on and then you pull out the shitty copy and get a nice piece. Yeah. yeah. But that, that's basically my process for me. Yeah. No, I like that because um, that will apply to anything, visualization. And I think we don't do it enough. I think if you want to solve problems for people, 
and you want them to reach in your product in, in their pocket and buy something that's going to solve a problem, I think you have to understand what their problems are. And not just understand the problem by knowing them. I think it's helpful to feel what they're feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, empathy. It's basically empathy. What's it like to be that? What's it like to be that midget in Uganda who's, uh, you know what I mean? What is it like? Yeah. You know, some, the very same reason we watch the news and 12,000 people get blown up in Uganda. You know, that sucks for them. But it happened in Iowa or Brooklyn or in the States. Oh my God, it's devastating. Yeah. So it's empathy. You can't relate to Uganda yeah. from here. Yeah. And, you know, Steve, I don't want to minimize going from borrowing 10000 to big success, hiring a lot of people. What was a big turning point in between those points where you kind of took off? The big turning point? Well, I mean, you know, one, my ad started as a little thumbnail. Yeah. Bigger, bigger, and then competitors would come in and they'd put an ad that was bigger than mine and mine would be bigger. I mean, at one point, I was almost a half page. Um Staying ahead of the fray, being competitive. And the big turning point, I guess, I don't know. I really don't know. Just gradually over time. Over night, it seemed to, you know, you had one success and they tell somebody else, and another guy, and now you yeah. have this huge clientele. Yeah. What was one of the early successes that you remember? I guess it was one where it was, it was a two step, and I forget what company it was for. Um, it's where I did a, a uh, and again, this was a newspaper ad, where it was for a paint product. It was a, a, a paint product, a roll-on. And the roll-on was uh, had a little capsaicin in it. So we put it on and it was a little burn. And we had a doctor and we said, you know, this is so incredible. It's so amazing. You know what? I don't want to charge you. Don't believe me. Try it for yourself. Just give us your address. Put in two bucks, we'll send you a free sample. And in the free sample, you know, like a little handy one. Um, one of these kind of things. Mm -hmm. You know, you get at a restaurant. Yeah. And it would follow up with a letter and it said, they, 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 they follow up with a DM package and said, here's the sample you asked us to send you. You asked me to send you. I didn't do it. You told me to send it. And then you'd open it up and go, just imagine. You know, where, where is your pain? Before you put this on, tell me, where does it hurt? Is it in your wrist? Is it in your shoulders? You know, is it your ass? Where does it really hurt? Because you only have a one, one shot. So think. <laughs> then you open it up and you put it on. You go. You feel that burn. That's the. You know, that's the special ingredients going deep into the pores. You know, wow, that really does work. And then we sold them bottle after bottle after bottle. That was a, that was a great success. I think the name of the product, but that was that was huge. Yeah. And then from the, oh, go ahead, go on. So. What are some of the most successful campaigns and why they were effective? What was what was one that you think back on? Wow, we blew that out of the water. Well, that that was one. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was a you know we had a coinciding catalog, and the catalog, you know, I believe, the first six to ten pages was just for this product. Well, wow. out, out of a you know a thirty-two page book, there was a lot of cost behind the product, but it did pretty. That's well. huge, yeah. yeah. It's pretty good. Any others that you think of? There was a one I was looking at, um, the stand up like you're 20. Yeah, you mean the ads that you can't say anything about? Yes. You know, that was. Uh, How'd you come up with that headline for one? I, I don't remember that one. I know you mentioned that, but yeah. there was one for the Better Sex video. Okay. It was, it was, uh, it was Adam and Eve had a very educational DVDs about, you know, for couples on the happy called the Better Sex videos. And. Man, I can't say anything. But... All right. Imagine the best sex you ever had. Now multiply that by twenty. <laughs> so that that worked. I I don't remember steadily twenty, but you really now it's gotten even worse. You can't really say anything. Why? Else. What? Why can't you say anything? The papers won't print it. Oh, uh, it's too it's, graphic. You mean? And. and you know, a lot of times it's just, it's, it's too graphic, well, it's too graphic, they don't want to talk about sex, because, you know, it's, again, the papers are going to people in, you know, middle America and 70 and above, and they, they get offended. So, you have to find ways to, to reach them, smiling Bob did it, you know, to reach them without without saying it. Mm -hmm. You talk to me with a wink, but just don't let anybody else know what we're talking about. 
Yeah. You know? Yeah. So what about the, I mean, there's a number of them on here, like print, direct mail. Do you have a certain medium that you prefer writing for than others? Because you've written or done most of anything. Uh, it's all sales. You know, it's, it's, it's sales on paper, it's sales on web, sales on media. Your salesman on paper or, or the air. It's just sales. Yeah. No matter. Sales is sales. I mean, like, you know, you write, um, you know, do a postcard or a Magalog. Obviously, Magalog is going to be a lot more work. Like, you may prefer that because it's longer. I don't know. Well, you know what? A postcard, I find, and Dave Klein asked him, you know, you makes fun of me all the time. I'll tell him a postcard is harder than that. Really? Why? Because I've got to make a sale with a few words. Mm-hmm. I've got to get into that person's head and get the wallet out of their, their, their pocket and make a phone call yeah. with a few words or images. Where Magalog, you know, they have 24 pages. I don't want to read that. And this headline doesn't grab me. This headline doesn't grab me. Oh, this headline grabs me. Let me read about that. You know, you have, you have room to sell. you got to hope and pray that that postcard, you know, uh, uh, will grab somebody's attention. And the same thing, the same thing with radio. I mean, that's what testing's about. Yeah. So, what do you think sells well or doesn't sell well f- with postcards? Like, what would you say? Don't use a postcard for this. Anything that requires education. I have to teach you what a product is. I don't have any room. Yeah. You know, I can sell you Mercedes Benz for a dollar fifty. Easily in a postcard, but I can't sell you a you know a doctor's resuscitation whatever machine they use in you know radiology in a postcard unless you know what it is. Mm-hmm. So I need room. I need room to educate. I'm going to go to a lower format. If it's something that's common and easily understandable, then you know a smaller format is fine. Yeah. So I mean, everything has its, its place, place. Yeah. So you were mentioning before we started talking about ugly up front. Ugly up front. Tell me about that. There was a guy named Drew Kaplan. And Drew Kaplan used to have the DAC catalog. And I learned that lesson from him. And he talked about how he'd bring in all these goods from China. And he found this burglar along. A little square, black, really a non-dramatic piece of metal that really couldn't protect anybody. And that would be the first thing he'd say. It's just like a little black cube. And the first objection to showing this was, you know, world's greatest burglar. What? This little piece of crap. And he started the copy with, this may look ineffective and tiny, but you're going to be glad you have it, you know, when you need it. Because this is loud, piercing scream and this and that. So you get the ugly up front. Get the ugly, get the edge of the objection before you even start and get in good shape. Uh, Hillary Clinton just did it. She did it with, it's not about me, it's about you. And that's her new campaign. Get the ugly up front. It's not about Benghazi, it's about you. You could say that for anything, yeah. Well, yeah. Get, get, answer the objections. If you can answer an objection right up front, then you'll get them to read to the end. If you can't answer the objection, no one's reading. What would be an example? Um, Stephen, like the health niche and a health product of when someone or you put the ugly up front? Well, that's a tough one. You know, I didn't get the questions till about a half hour, an hour. Ago. I just made that one up. So, <laughs> you know, I I'm just curious because I know you do a lot of health stuff, and I'm trying to visualize, you know, I could see if a product. You, know, you can describe it and there's something wrong with it or doesn't look cool. I'm trying to think of like um, in aging, anti-aging or vitamin or prostate or... If you tell somebody you're going to have a whole new stomach lining within a year, you're going to have you know new skin within days. You know, I think you, know, you, you start saying these outrageous claims, you better be ready to qualify that. And the right. way to qualify that is saying, look, you may think I'm crazy. You may think it's unbelievable, but just give me a minute. Mm-hmm. Let me explain. So let me explain clause helps a lot. Mm-hmm. You get some to read, and then you have to explain why the science behind it. Now do you get me? Okay. Yeah. That makes sense? Look, there's, there's uh, uh, 
just coming out you know, at the top of my head. But what if I told you there was a pill that could make you taller? What are you talking about? Well, see, I know you might think I'm crazy. You might think I'm crazy, but you know, you lose water as you age. Yeah. The discs start to deplete, and the water starts to deplete. So now this gives moisture to your discs, it starts plumping up, and you have your height again. Oh, okay, I get it. But you have to answer that objection. Mm -hmm. I may be nuts, but if you give me a minute, mm -hmm. you'll understand. Right. So it's kind of like you went, what you said in the beginning is about being conversational. You wouldn't just tell your friend, this amazing thing, you'd probably kind of preface it with, I'm pro you probably think I'm crazy with this, or you're upfronting what they're thinking. Jeremy's drinking again. All right, come on, let's hear it. Yeah. They got to get over that objection, sure. Yeah. Um, and, I you know, I don't know if you're drinking. <laughs> um, you know, I also was looking through some of the direct mail packages in print. What I thought was interesting is you use different images. I was wondering if there's a rhyme or reason. Like one of them, there's a, like a person and there's their brain uh, for for one of the one of the things. Uh, why let your memory waste away? And there's another one that's a doctor. Is there a what's a method if someone's thinking about putting images in their copy? What should they be thinking about? Images are just. Copy storytelling selling a product is like a car. You may have the greatest engine in the world, but the car looks like crap. No one's going to buy it. Those images have to tell the story along with the copy. Because no one reads these little things called letters. They have to be pulled in. And so images kind of give you a, uh, oh, what's this about? What is it? There's a headline in this image. Oh, now let me read on. So, yeah, um, images are very important. And often I'll test different images uh, in, in, along with testing copy because it's what brings the eye into uh, the envelope, you know? Mm -hmm. What's uh, been a campaign that didn't work as well and why? God, there's been hundreds. Those are the ones called, those are the best ones. Those are the ones called learning, learning curve, you know? And there's nothing that never, that doesn't work that I can't fix. Yeah. At least now in my career, things you know, things don't work. You have to sit and analyze and test. And if the client is willing to test with you, you'll get it to work. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we can misread. It's very easy to misread an audience. You know, I have no idea why a uh, you know an eighty year old guy would buy a natural Viagra. No idea. So we'll try different things and different things, and eventually you kind of figure it out. The reason why we figured out, I'm not going to say it uh, uh, you know, in this form, but I figured it out. And you have to test. So what's something that surprised you that didn't work that you now know when you go to your copy for a certain market or a certain demographic? I'm going to, is there, is there a lifeline? Can I, can I? Yeah, you could hit a lifeline. I just, I, I'll have to call Dave Klein on that. I really don't remember that. I, 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 we'll skip that question. <laughs> Anything recently that um, you know just surprised you in general from testing that most that would be valuable for someone? Because I'm sure you've done a lot of different tests throughout the years. You know, the, the longer you're in the business of selling, and the, the better you get, the more you realize that you're nothing. You're nothing. Because things change, things change so rapidly, and, and you know, if you told me even four weeks ago that you could write uh, something called an advertorial, you know what an advertorial is? What the audience does it's an ad that kind of looks like an article in the newspaper. And if you told me that you would put in the headline, make the headline not look like a newspaper ad, and kind of sell the product right up front, I'd say it would never work. And just recently, there was a headline that right up is selling the product. And it was gangbusters. Can't figure it out. There were uh, promotional pieces that have gone out recently where they were from other countries, writers from other countries. And the English was just all wrong. And it was terrible. I mean, I would think that it was just bad proofreaders. Through the roof. So bad that, so. That is weird. So high that we said, hey, do it again. Don't proof it. Just do it again. 
I've now written pieces where I've translated into French and back into English and left the mistakes. Ask me why. Why? It just worked. Just worked. So if you see something successful, let's let's keep doing it. I'd love to figure it out, but you tell me. I have no idea. Bad language, bad dad. You know, it, it sounded like a like a Frenchman trying to speak English. He didn't really know English that well. That's Climbed strange. Going, man, through the roof. So, what are some of the common mistakes you think people make? Besides, um, I know you mentioned obviously not understanding their their customer. But when you you have a lot of writers that work for you, what do you find that you're correcting? Conversation. You know, if you again, if you use the words vigor and virility, speak like that. Connect with the, the, the reader. Understand the reader's problems. Understand the reader's pain. Understand the reader's embarrassment. Understand how to fix the problems. Yeah. And if you start speaking in a language that sounds like you know, you're writing a textbook instead of having a conversation, that's that's your piece is going down. It's over. Mm-hmm. What's your process, Steve? If you, you know, let's say you get a package and you're going to write it from beginning to end. You're not going to hand it off to anyone. Well, that's, that's about, I'd say, between 25 and 30% of my business. Yeah. Where do you start? What do you do first? So people can kind of get inside your decades of experience. I, I, I treat it like, uh, you know, those coloring books when we were kids and do the outline and then you fill it in. Yeah. You know, I, I, I outline it, I figure out all of the points I want to hit. And what pages and what order they should be in, and uh, I start. You know, once you have the outline and an idea, not even the headline, but a concept, of what the headline should be about. Yeah, it's kind of easy to fill everything in. Yeah, that's where I start. I kind of I have it laid out in front of me, and just have to fill in the dots. I mean, do you start with outline? Do you start with the headline, or do you start just with bullet points? Or you know, you could be hung up on an opening headline for weeks. Headlines are hard. Yeah. So, you know, if I don't have a headline, I'll just write a crappy headline to begin with and then start writing. The process is to start writing because I don't care how good you are. Uh, the beginning of your experience is going to be a lot worse than your end because you just have to start. So like jogging. You know, you start jogging. You get that pain. hurts. You know, all this stuff. You mean dolphins and run. This is awesome. You don't get awesome in jogging from the first few feet. So it's the same thing, you know, you just start writing. Start writing and just, you'll throw out most of the stuff you began with, but it'll start the endorphin, the endorphic writing. It it's keeps like, you going. Yeah. Just yeah. Start getting, okay. What about, you know, obviously you deal with clients. This is not in a vacuum. Is there certain things that you advise clients to do that they don't listen? Yeah, all the time. You know, I've got the purse strings, and you can do it my way. And my answer is, I'll do it your way. I'll gladly take your money. Just write me a check, and just put it in my pocket. Or you can do it the way I've seen it work for dozens and dozens of guys before you. Let me take it. Blame it on me if it doesn't work. Because you're going to blame it on me if it doesn't work. Either. <laughs> you're going to get the blame either way. Either way. So let me, let, me, let me at least try my way. Or let's try your way and try my way. Let's test it. What do you get pushback about? Like when they say they want to trade their way, what is the difference usually between their way and what you want to do? I think the biggest pushback comes from the guys that, you know, the glorified copywriters, the students of copy who take all these courses and they start reading and it's almost equivalent to a guy who's just starting in karate and gets his green belt and thinks he can kick everybody's ass, you know? And they're out there, you know, I want you to do it this way because I read in this course and this guy said this. And, All right, okay. And then I'm going to try it my way. I'm going to test it and see what happens. You know, inevitably I beat the shit out of the group. <laughs> with jujitsu. With, with, with uh, yeah, word jujitsu. So you also mentioned not about. Say, not to say that. Yes, you could say whatever you want. Oh, no, not whatever I want. I mean, I don't edit, so. Uh, I, I, the first person to kick been kicked off the web. The best. I don't think so. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Dave Letterman. David Letterman. I was I was virtually on the David Letterman show. I was a guest on the David Letterman show. 
Actually, I brought a, uh, 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 an example. Um, I had to write a, uh, an ad for this product when it first came out. Read Read scripts. You know it? Yeah. Have you ever used it? No. Oh, it's very effective. Um, so this is a Breed Right strip, ladies and gentlemen. And how it works is you, you open this up and you, you kind of put it on your nose and it expands your... your so now I can... Ah, I can breathe wonderful. So anyway, so I, I had to write about this thing. Now this thing is kind of clear. And when you take a picture of it, it's kind of hard to photograph. So I put the words at a circle around it and it said, Virtually invisible. Virtually invisible. You take this off now, it's really it's annoying. <laughs> so I go to work one day and I walk in and people are looking at me and as soon as I look at the door, they go, virtually invisible. Walk past the front desk, virtually invisible. I walk to my office and people are passing by all day. Virtually invisible. What the heck is going on? Turns out that Letterman had a catalog and showed my ad at the beginning of the show. You know how they show things? Yeah. And he just got a kick out of the red circle and he kept on saying, virtually invisible. And you know when no one laughs at Letterman, so he just continues to do it through the whole show to they laugh? That was me. So I was a guest on Letterman. I didn't even know it till the next day. I like that. That's my story. Is there a clip on that online so we can play that? I hope not. I'm going to find it. <laughs> um, so, Steve, I always ask because you know, it's Inspired Insider. Um, what's been the lowest moment, and then how you push forward through the tough time? We mentioned one before, where I was, you know, I had a big house and cars and kids and dogs and, and no money coming in. That was that was tough and starting a business um, because I, I've always worked for somebody. So making that jump from becoming an employee to an employer was, that was a rough one. That was a rough one. Um, I've had other obstacles in my life. Uh, last year, I um, was diagnosed with cancer. Oh, my. So, and I, I beat the crap out of it with my green belt and hurts. And, uh, and that wasn't the worst part of last year. But I uh, you know, um, never let it go, and I'm good. And, the only reason I brought up the cancer story is because somebody else had one. I thought mine was better. <laughs> Trying to talk about Yeah, nothing. Yeah. I mean, I think that's an important point to talk about because I think when people talk about their companies and their successes, that's usually what gets highlighted in the real world stuff, health problems or other things never kind of make their way in. And it's a reality you have to deal with that and deal with family and deal with your business too. How do you do all that? The biggest fear was, man, how am I going to, you know, uh, keep the people that depend on me alive? You know, what am I going to do? Am I going to die? Is it all the stuff that the mortality right. starts to hit you? And you, you know, and you know, you have to keep yourself grounded. And and, and I think what really got me through it more than anything, and it was a very tough form, aggressive form of cancer. That for one of the very few people. Uh, lucky enough to beat it because of, and I'm going to say this to everybody, uh, early diagnosis, go for your exams early, go for your, you know, your prostate exams, go for your, uh, uh, it's what saved my life, but I think work is what pulled me through it, it distracted you mm. through the method writing and stuff like that, brought you into other worlds, and I was able to escape from that, at least for the hours that I was writing, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, there's nothing like, uh, yeah, and also just kind of bringing all this money before I, you know, meet the Grim Reaper. But uh, luckily, I beat it, and uh, yeah. life was good. Um, yeah, congratulations. That's, that's, that's too. thanks. Yeah. Um, what type of cancer was it? It was pancreatic. Oh my which, god. Yeah, they say uh, the worst. Within, within uh, if you know you have it, you're probably going to be dead within a year. So that was the story I heard. But because I went through this early screening, uh, my sister. Uh, urged me to do it. Um, really? And I'd been, been estranged, for, estranged from her for years. And out of the blue, she said, go get tested. Why did she say that? Were you having some? She got it. She got it. Really? She got it. And um, just went. And they, when I went to the doctor, he said, look, you should have come to me in three years and been dead in four. Wow. Um, 
That's amazing. But I, I, I because of early detection, I, I, thankfully, yeah. I got through it. It, was, it wasn't even, you know, it wasn't even a factor. I got through it. Wow. I mean, early detection is one thing, but you have this kick. I'm going to kick anyone's, you know, butt mindset. I mean, that's just how you are. So that has something to do with it. Grow up with long hair during the disco, disco era in Brooklyn. So <laughs> you got to survive. Did right? you get your butt kicked a lot, or what? Well, if you got your butt kicked, if you got your butt kicked, then you know you were you were less than a human being, and if you won, you were a musician. You said, "I have long hair," and everybody else was doing that, that disco thing. Okay, so you know, we were sort of like the freaks and the outsiders back then, but. Uh, yeah. You gotta, you gotta be competitive, and you had to fight all the time. Yeah. Uh, that's the way it was growing up in Brooklyn. Yeah. No, thanks for sharing that. It's, uh, congrats on just being the crap. Most crapper. of my clients don't know that. Know this, so uh, if they see this, it's like, I'm alive and healthy, guys. And yeah. You might kill it alive back. and healthy, and kicking more stronger than ever. On the other side of things, Steve. Um, so, what's been one of the proudest moments and accomplishments? The proudest moments. Yeah. Could be business and personal. I, I, I don't know if it was a moment more than a, 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 just a gradual rise of success. And I guess the proudest moments I have happen every time that I get a, a, a royalty check. And they say, man, this was a hit. Tell this me about one of the royal, big royalty checks huh? and what you felt. Wait, wait, repeat that question? Tell me about one of the big royalty checks and then what you did with one of them. I, you know, there's anything I did with it. It's just, yeah. Well, I mean, the, when you didn't have money, you took all your money, you spent it on kids' toys, so you must have done something with it. Squirreled it away. You're like, I'm a Jew, you know that. Right? <laughs> That's what we do with money. They said, Jesus saves, but Moses invests. Very important. I mean, you didn't buy yourself any fun toys or go on a vacation or oh, yeah. something to celebrate. Of course, you know, uh, you, your lifestyle goes up and you go on cruises and you do some fun stuff and hit your bucket list. But uh, nothing nothing that stands out in my mind. You kind of like to, to pin me down to these little snapshots. I can't remember them. Well, that's what happens when you have decades of experience. So I find with your, it's hard to choose one. You it's know? hard to choose one. Yeah. I've, I've had more fun than any guy should, you know, they claim to. I've had a lot of fun. As far as uh, uh, my career, I've done a lot of things that I'm proud of and <laughs> a lot of things that I'm ashamed of. But um, it, it's been a fun ride. And uh, not ready to get off yet. Yeah. You know, there was one uh, quote on your website from um, Joe Russo. And he says, we're mailing 1.5 million packages per month. That's a lot of packages. That's a lot of packages. That's a that's a lot of cruises. It's good. Yeah. So what are they what are they mailing? Uh, I don't remember. I haven't looked at my website in a while. I don't know which one you reference, but uh, uh, I I don't remember. But uh, I've had a lot of those. I'm just yeah. curious. Like that's a large number. It was a health package. Yeah. You know that's that's the bulk of the stuff that I do. I mean, I do a lot. I work in all worlds. I, written hundreds and hundreds of psychic pieces for uh, psychic pieces for Europe yeah you put the babushka on your head and stir the cauldron and you have a little wart on your nose and you know you, you Dave you know Dave Klein we've, yeah, we've chatted come come on come on he's at it okay goodbye my best friend Dave Klein one of the most intelligent guys I know um, I'm sure you're going to have a, a Episode we we chatted with yes we've chatted. He said he's going to meet you in Chicago. So yes, he's uh, one of the most gracious, uh, smartest, best business guys I know. Told me a hell of a lot. I've been uh, affiliated with Dave for about a decade now. And, uh, How did you I, meet? Dave called me up and saw that I was uh, the leader of the pack in, in uh, copy world for a while. He said, "Hey, you know what?" I've got this big 30-foot booth. Why don't you not even spend money on your own booth? And again, going back to my area, just oh, that's fine. Just work out of my booth. Put your picture back there. And yeah, come on down. So we started, 
I, I did a trade show with him and we hit it off like brothers. And, uh, Do people was, tell you you could, you look alike or no? Everybody. Yeah. everybody. And, and I insist that, you know, if you're right, I'm the much better looking one. Always <laughs> everywhere. Um, so, Steve, a few, a few other things. I want to hear um, any, any best advice that you have for people writing copy. You know, obviously there's a lot of copy. You have writers that work under you, but a lot of people are probably working solo. What, uh, what, what should we leave them with that they should start? Because we talked a lot about different things here. I, again, I think the most important part is to, you know, speak to your audience as you would speak to a friend. Give advice to your audience as friends. Solve their problems as you were a friend. Yeah. It, be sincere because people, you know, people. A lot of people out there may not be educated, but they're smart, and they know when they're being bullshitted. Um, speak in common language. You know, anybody could use a ten-dollar word. Smart people understand ten dollar words. Not so smart people don't understand them. But they also understand smart people also understand the one dollar words. So if you can if you can speak in a New York Post type mentality where everybody understands what you're saying, uh, um, you'll get a lot more viewers. Yeah. Readers. You know, without pandering to them, you know. You, you have to make sure that you're not pandering to them, but, but speak simply, speak concisely, and speak honestly. Howard Stern's rule. Howard Stern said it. You know, I, I don't know. Have you ever seen the Howard Stern movie? No, Where, a long time ago. He had, he had a revelation, and they gave him this thing about this restaurant or some, you know, department stores. Oh, yeah, I go there every day. I buy everything from the store. And he goes, I never even heard of this place. I don't do this. And, and he, he realized at that moment, that being honest with his viewers, my readers, is, is the most important thing. And if you don't believe in the product, which, hey, we don't believe in everything we sell, you better believe it while you're writing it. You better convince yourself that this is the, 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 the best thing ever while you're writing it. You yes, can let go, you can let go of it later, but you better believe it, you know? And if this pill doesn't make you feel 30 years younger while you're writing that, feel it. Feel it, believe it. Want it. Want that product. There's, there's no way you can sell anything you don't want. Right. So, Steve, I have one last question uh, before I ask it. First of all, I appreciate your time. Where should we point people towards? Where should they check out? Check you out online? Uh, I guess I would go to this phone or dial 631-736-6565 and speak to Alice and we can uh, uh, help you sell your products as well. All right. And uh, wexdirect.com. There's Oops. a lot of cool, uh, all the images, direct mail packages, print ads, magalogs, all that fun stuff is on there. I think I'm even on a flying carpet over the page. You are? Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. You yeah. do come on. Um, my last question is uh, what keeps you going? I mean, obviously, you don't have to keep doing this. You know, it's interesting. I asked the same question to one of my employers years ago, a very wealthy man, and he never never stopped working, never stopped working. And I said, you have enough money to have your kids, 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 kids live for the rest of their lives. Unfortunately, I'm not in that position. Uh, but I said, why did you do it? And he looked at me and said, notches on the belt. Because it's not about the money, which is really helpful. I like money as much as anybody else. It's about the successes. It's about being the best. It's about, you know, am I the best? Bob, you're the best. You know, Bob Bly, you're the best. I want to be one of the best. I, I want to have a legacy. I want people to remember, you know, um, at least some of the words, something I can share with them. Yeah. It's about competitiveness. It's about Brooklyn. It's about being beat up by the disco guys. You mentioned Bob. Who are oh. other colleagues you respect? Uh, um, Peter Bechtel, I think, is awesome. Awesome writer. Uh, Bob Bly, again, awesome. Different. Um, uh, there's just dozens. Uh, uh, Clayton Maypiece uh, is amazing. 
although he's a teabagger and hardcore Republicans, so I don't agree with anything he says, other than his copy is brilliant. Um, and, and then in the, the non-copy world, again, uh, guys like Adam Moran here and Dave Klein and uh, uh, just dozens and dozens of people I respect. Yeah. Talking a lot, whether you're writers or not. Yeah. Yeah. Steve, I appreciate it. Anything else? Any other stories that I'm that we didn't talk about? I know you you made a few notes. Um, what did we not hit on that would be a fun story to tell? Don't let attorneys scare you when you're writing. I try to write. Well, first thing I do is I ask my my clients a one in ten. What's your aggression level? But everybody knows. If you're at a 10, you're going to sell a lot. Mm. At a 1, you're not going to sell anything. So what's your aggression level? If you're at a 5, you're going to write to a 7. If you're at a 7, you're going to write to a 10 or a 9. And a lot of people get flustered by That's an term. interesting question. I wouldn't have even guessed you asked that question. Actually. Oh, it's, oh, it's because you know I'm going to write to a 10, and the guy says, I can't say anything. can't make any claims on my product. Hmm. Unfortunately, in the supplement world, there's a lot of great products out there, and there's a lot of rules and regulations when you can't say, can't cure anything. Even though I can I can cure aging, aging isn't a disease, I won't use the word cure. Um, so I, I don't let the lawyers scare me. I try to work my magic against them. They're only working with words, so I work with words. And I'll give you a good example. Um, a few years back a lawyer said to me, I couldn't say now available without prescription. Hmm. And a lot of these, you know, you get a, a, a bad attorney and he just wants a red line and everything you do and you got to write over, you can't say anything. And he gets his debt put on his house and the client just sell nothing, <laughs> you know. So he said, I can't say not available without prescription, now available without prescription. And I asked him what his objection was and he wouldn't tell me, he wouldn't tell me, I pushed and pushed till they just hate my guts. And finally he said, you can't say it because it inferred that it had a prescription before and it doesn't need it now. And that's legal. So say, now available without prescription. Now available. How about available now without prescription? It's available now. You don't need a prescription. Oh, yeah, you can say that. So it's, it's your words against theirs. You can, you can figure out ways around everything. Write to say what you want to say and then fix it later. Don't, be, don't let him scare you off. Else you're going to have milk toast and that sort of work. Why do you think he pushed back so much and didn't tell you why? Because he was nervous, I guess, that if you came to a solution, he would look like the, the you know, ineffective. Yeah. You know, a good attorney, and there's a lot of great ones, uh, I would say Andy Lustigman, you know, and Manhattan was terrific, understand that you have to make a living. And they understand that you have to sound aggressive. And they'll give you really bad ways to say stuff compliantly, and then you can figure out good ways to say it and sell it. Yeah. Bad attorney just redlines. And, I did my job. Don't worry about making money. If you don't make money, I'll go to another client that has money. You know. So the attorneys, you know, us copywriters work with attorneys constantly, especially in, in regulated fields like supplements, and drugs, and things like that. But don't let them scare you off and kill your copy. Right to the aggression level of the client, and you'll deal with the attorneys later. Just make sure the attorney understands from the beginning, you're not going to be easy. Yeah. You fight back, and either you're going to win or they're going to win, but at the end, the client wins. Yeah. Anything else on that sheet that we make sure to cover? <sighs> Cure for the absent-minded. I don't know why I wrote that. Uh, it, just, it sounds like a headline that I'm going to use later on, but I don't know. So that's the only thing I need. Nobody steal that yet. I got to get that out first. Okay? <laughs> Steve, I appreciate it. I want to be the first one to thank you so much uh, for your time on this. No problem. Yeah. Great time. It's great talking. All right. I'll speak to you soon. Take care.